You bet. And what time do you do you go till fully? Just so I know when I should stop. Um, we've got till eleven. Okay. But it's yeah. I'll be. I think I'll probably be under fifty minutes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Parkinson Association of Alberta's webinar for Wednesday. My name is Sherry Bauer Gagne, and I'm the client services coordinator out in the Parkinson's Alberta Lloyd Minster region, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, just uh, click them into the chat below. And uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a chat blurb icon there. And if you click it there, it'll appear to the right hand side in a drop down menu. And we can uh, talk about some of those questions towards the end. This webinar will be recorded and all information provided in the video is the Parkinson Association and feature speaker is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes. Um, this service is not intended to be diagnostic or prescriptive or replace relationship advice or care or under the care of your physician. So what I'd like to do right now is introduce you to Charlotte Ryder Burbage. See, I did get it right. See, <laughs> recently graduated from the University of Alberta's School of Public Health with a Master's of Science in Epidemiology. Um, inspired by the idea of creating physical and social environments that better facilitate mobility for people with mobility challenges, her graduate research aimed to understand if and why mobility patterns of people with Parkinson's disease are different from people without the disease. So how do motor and non-motor symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease affect how people move around the community? What barriers and facilitators to everyday mobility do people with Parkinson's disease face? And uh, these are the types of questions that guided Charlotte research titled does living with Parkinson's disease affect life space mobility so let's let's welcome Charlotte as she leads us through some of her research and uh, get better informed on this. welcome Charlotte thanks so much for joining us thank you so much for having me um I'm yeah. so I'm so grateful to be here as I was just explaining um the Parkinson's Association has been hugely instrumental and helpful to me throughout the, my master's uh, in terms of helping me with, with helping me with recruitment and advertising my research. And uh, I really couldn't have done it without them. So I'm really happy to be back here today to share with you what I found throughout my master's thesis. Um, so the general plan for today is to take you through the introduction to this research, why why we wanted to conduct it, and why it's why we think it's important. Um, then I'll talk a bit about how, how we conducted the research and the methods. Um, I'll sh talk to you about the results. And then finally, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about the implications of these results. So I wanted to start here with this nice photo of this luscious bed, because I can bet that it's where most of us started our day to day. And if we think about it, the bedroom really is one of the epicenters of our lives. It's where we start every day and it's where we end every day. And it's also kind of the start of where this idea of life space mobility begins. So life space mobility estimates the magnitude or extent of travel into the environment, regardless of how one gets there. So in other words, as you get further away from your bedroom, you enter more distant life spaces. And that's kind of how we calculate this measure. So um, we live our lives kind of in concentric circles, uh, radiating out from our bedroom. And each time we move further away from our bedroom, we're entering a new type of life space. Um, in this study, we used a tool called the life space assessment, which is a tool that's typically used to measure life space. And it asks people to recall their movements in a typical week in the last month. So there are five levels of life space starting at the bedroom and um, ending outside town. Um, and the life space assessment asks different questions for each of these levels. So did you reach this level of life space? How frequently did you go there? Did you require any assistance? And based on people's answers to these questions, we calculate a score from zero to 120, where a higher score indicates higher life space or higher mobility. Um, so zero here is, is bed bound and 120 would mean that you're outside of the city uh, every day of the week independently. So without using uh, an assistive mobility device or needing the help from another person. 
and we call this score the 0 to 120 score, the composite score. There are a few other metrics of life space that we can that we can look at, and they're called the independent, assisted, and maximal life space. And these kind of look at um, what different types of aids or help that people needed to get to the various levels of life space. So um, maybe you walk around without a mobility device in your home, but if you're going to the coffee shop on the corner, you decide that you want to take your walker or your cane. So we factor all of these uh, choices into the measurement of life space. So we get this really nice simple score of life space to represent mobility, but of course mobility is anything but simple. In fact, it's quite complex. Um, so this is uh, a model of mobility that was um, that was created by uh, a researcher that came before me. Um, and what she did, um, Weber, was, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was share the idea of mobility. Um, and mobility determinants. So each of these colors in the cone are a type of mobility determinant. So they could be physical, um, psychosocial, which means something that affects the desire or motivation to be, to be mobile. Um, it could be an environmental factor, a financial factor, or a cognitive factor. So these are all the different things that are going on in someone's life that might affect whether or not they're mobile. And then the brown arrow that we have is the idea that all of our experiences are shaped by who we are, so our gender or our culture. Um, and that can also affect how we're mobile. And the model here takes on the conical shape because the idea is that as you get further away from your bedroom into more distant life spaces, more of these factors come into play. So for example, it might be really easy for me to walk down the street to go to Shoppers Drug Mart, but if you ask me to meet you in Grand Prairie, it's gonna take a little bit more work for me to get there. So that's why uh, the model takes on this conical shape. And so it's easy to imagine why um, the symptoms that people have with Parkinson's disease can affect their mobility and affect the, the different determinants in that conical model. Um, so for example, um, Parkinson's is, is accompanied by both motor and non-motor symptoms and something like uh, stiffness or a balance problem might make it more difficult for someone to get, get out into their community. Um, but then there's also things like depression and anxiety, which can manifest as something that's uh, physical and emotional and psychological, and those things can all affect someone's desire um, or ability to be mobile as well. Um, another reason why the model, the clinical model is good for Parkinson's is because people with Parkinson's have such a, a vast variety of experiences um, and, and everybody's experience is unique. So the, so the model kind of encapsulates all those different unique experiences and all the different things that might affect their, abil their ability to be mobile. So next, let's talk about mobility and why it's important uh, to maintain mobility. So again, people that have come before me and done some research in this area um, have shown that if people age optimally with Parkinson's disease and they're able to stay mobile in their communities, they're able to live dynamic and independent lives at home or in somewhere else of their choosing. But in contrast, if people start to lose their mobility, that can lead to physical deconditioning and reduce social participation, um, which can also increase the risk of falling, um, cognitive, cognitive decline, uh, disability, and the loss of independence, so being able to look after yourself. So that led us in to the questions that we had for this research. So the first question or objective was to compare the life space score of and patterns of people with Parkinson's disease to healthy peers of a similar age. So this would allow us to compare the two groups and see if there are different things going on with people with Parkinson's that don't go on with their with their kind of age match peers um, that could maybe be the target of different interventions to help them maintain their mobility. The second objective was to identify personal, social, and environmental variables that factor into the life space mobility of people with Parkinson's disease. And again, this would help us figure out what are some places that we could, um, that we could work on to help Im improve or maintain the mobility of people with Parkinson's. And the qualitative objective uh, was to use that conical model, so that comprehensive framework for mobility to explore the barriers and facilitators to life space mobility that can be targeted by interventions and policies to promote community mobility among people with Parkinson's disease. 
Now I'll talk about the methods. Um, so this research was what we call a multiple methods research. So what that means is that we use different strategies of, of research um, to look, to collect and look at the data. Um, so we recruited uh, people with and without Parkinson's for this research, and then we asked them to complete a survey and possibly an interview as well. So the survey here um, is what we call the, a quantitative method. So it helps us get some really cold, hard numbers about what we're looking at. And the interview is what we call a qualitative method. Um, so we use people's stories and their words to create meaning and, and add some context in depth to the research. So for the recruitment, we had 227 people total who participated in this research, um, about half of whom had Parkinson's disease and about half of whom did not. So the people with Parkinson's um, were all older adults, so 60 plus with Parkinson's disease, and they had been diagnosed with the disease for at least six months. Um, we intended to just have the recruitment area be Edmonton, um, but we kind of had to start expanding our bubble as uh, we had a little bit of difficulty with recruitment and getting up the numbers that we needed. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, the Parkinson's Association was, was huge in, uh, in helping me get participants for the studies. Um, I spent quite a bit of time loitering around the Buchanan Center asking people to fill out my survey uh, or following Declan around to uh, various support groups around in and around Edmonton. Uh, we also had the help of a couple of community neurologists who who recommended to their patients that they uh, participate in the research or ask them if they were interested. Um, we had some people from Calgary who filled out the survey over the phone with, uh, from the Calgary Parkinson's Research Initiative. Uh, and we also had some people fill out the survey in a Parkinson's specific exercise class in Camrose. The comparison group uh, were also all older adults, so 60 plus, um, and they did not have Parkinson's and they were all recruited from seniors activity centers in Edmonton. So next I'll talk about the type of information that we kind of captured on this survey. So uh, it was self-report, which means that people filled it out themselves and they completed it uh, in person, over the phone or by mail, whichever was most convenient for them. We asked both the Parkinson's and the non-Parkinson's group um, a certain set of questions. So this was about their socio-demographics. So for example, their age, their gender, their financial situation and their education. We asked about their health status and their lifestyle behaviors. So what kind of physical activity they participated in, if they were smokers, et cetera. We asked about their transportation use, um, if they were kind of primarily drivers or if there were other kinds of transportation in the community that they used. We asked about the built environment. Um, so that's the actual physical space that you live in, in in your community. So is your community clean? Do you feel safe when you're walking around? Those kind of questions. We asked people about their social participation and um, how often they participated in different types of activities with other people outside of the home. And then finally, everybody um, filled out the life space assessment. So that, uh, that, question, that survey that asks um, questions about what life space areas you go into and how frequently you do that. The Parkinson's group had some additional questions that they had to answer. Um, so we asked about their disease duration, so how long they had had Parkinson's, the types of medications they were on, uh, and we also had them fill out something called the Parkinson's Disease Questionnaire 8, which is a measure of health-related quality of life. So of those 113 people with Parkinson's that participated in the survey, um, some of them indicated to us that they'd also be interested in being contacted to participate in an interview. So uh, what we did was we kind of tried to get a, a diverse group of people who were interested in participating in the interview and that had filled out the survey um, to also join us in this next step. So we looked for people that had a mix of life space scores. So some had higher scores and some had lower scores, a mix of ages uh, and gender. Um, and we recruited people until we reached something called data set saturation, which is when, um, so for example, the 10th person hadn't said anything new than the previous nine before them. The interviews were semi-structured, uh, which means that 
uh, I had an interview guide in front of me and I would ask people questions off that interview guide, but we did just try to have a natural conversation and we could kind of flow off, flow off each other. Um, and we, with permission, of course, um, audio recorded all of the interviews so that we could go back and listen to them and collect that data later. So these are the interview questions uh, that we asked. There were four broad questions that everyone was asked and I kind of had some prompts that I would, that I would use. Um, so the first one was, can you tell me about your experience with Parkinson's disease so far? What does mobility mean to you? Can you tell me about a time when you had difficulty getting somewhere you wanted or needed to go? And can you tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge related to your mobility? And the aim of these questions was really just to have people tell us stories about their mobility, um, any challenges um, that they face so that we could get kind of a good snapshot of what it's like uh, in this regard to live with, with, live with Parkinson's disease. So for the quantitative analysis, so this is how we um, dealt with the data that we collected off the surveys. We first compared the life space mobility of people with Parkinson's to people without Parkinson's. And the second uh, type of analysis that we did was that based on the responses to the survey, we used a statistical method called regression modeling to figure out what factors are best at predicting life space mobility. So we did this for both the Parkinson's disease group and the comparison group to see if the types of factors that predict life space are different among those two groups. And so I have this kind of uh, crude example of what it means to create a regression model. Uh, and the idea is that we use a regression model to predict the behavior of a dependent variable based on one or more independent variables. So in this little example, um, the dependent variable is the mood in Edmonton. And based on some hypothetical data I've collected, I can predict that the mood will be good in Edmonton if the sun is shining, the temperature is warm and the Oilers are winning. So that's kind of um, the, the concept that we've applied to this research. So in our case, the dependent variable is life space mobility. And based on the responses to the survey, we looked at different personal, social and environmental factors that can help us predict someone's life space mobility. So now that I've talked about how we dealt with the survey data, I'll talk about what we did with um, the interview data. So the audio recordings were transcribed word for word. So we had nice long sheets of everybody's interviews that we could read off of um, and remember what they said. And that allowed, allowed us to do something called content analysis, which um, means that we, we look at what people have said in their interviews and we try to find patterns and themes um, within the conversations that we had with people. So we created these themes from the data and the, and the analysis was guided by the conical model of mobility. So we looked at, um, we tried to find quote, quotes that were relevant to physical health, financial health, uh, emotional health, um, people who, who spoke about the environment and how that impacted their mobility. And so that was kind of how we started to break down all these different themes and patterns in, from the um, qualitative interviews. And we did this over time. So every time we had a new interview that we would analyze, we would kind of update the themes to make sure that it was still representative of all of the interviews as a whole. Okay, so let's get a little bit into the results and what we found. So first up, we just have a description of the participants and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this with you and, and tell you a little bit about what we found. Um, so on average, the group without Parkinson's disease was about four years older. So they were 75 compared to the Parkinson's disease group, which was 71. Um, the Parkinson's group was predominantly male. So 61% relative to 34% in the group without Parkinson's. So these are some important differences that we kind of noted and we kept in mind as we were doing the analysis. Um, the next pink line is uh, talking about assistive mobility devices. So 44% of people in the Parkinson's group reported that they use something like a cane or a walker to get around on a regular basis versus 15% in the without Parkinson's group. So that's already, again, another difference that we can see between the two groups. Um, there are also differences in the people who received um, informal caregiving. Um, 
And next uh, for the driver's licenses, 78% um, of people with Parkinson's reported having a valid driver's license versus 88%, so a little bit lower. Um, and a couple other notes about the group with Parkinson's is that they had on average had been diagnosed with Parkinson's for 8.3 years. And they had a, a mean PDQ8 score, so the Parkinson's disease question eight score of uh, 27, which um, kind of means that we can, we can assume that most of the people in this sample had um, or, uh, mild to moderate Parkinson's disease because we didn't ask people about their disease severity specifically because we would have had to use a clinical test to do that. Um, but the PDQ8 score can give us a bit of an idea. These are the results from uh, the life space assessment. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the life space composite score. So those are those pink numbers. So there, uh, you can, you'll remember that um, the score here was from zero to 120. So people with Parkinson's had a score of 64 out of 120, whereas people without Parkinson's disease had a score of 70 out of 120. So there's a six point difference between these two groups. Um, so the people with Parkinson's have a, a slightly lower score, um, but the difference wasn't actually statistically significant, which means that we had this predetermined threshold that we wanted to meet uh, to, to be able to say if the differences that we're seeing is real and it didn't quite meet that threshold. So, um, uh, so um, we aren't totally able to say that, we aren't, we aren't able to say confidently that people with Parkinson's have a lower life space score is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and next, if we look at the different life space levels that are reached and we have the independent, assisted and uh, maximal scores. So first I'll draw your attention to the independent scores and what the independent score looks at is what percentage of the people who filled out the survey are reaching these various levels of life space without um, the help of an aide or another person. So totally by themselves. And you can see that there are some differences in the two groups. So for example, 23% um, um, of people in the Parkinson's group are using a mobility aid or needing the help of another person around the house versus only 5% of people in the non-Parkinson's group. And this trend kind of continues all the way down uh, to beyond town. We just generally see that there's less independence in the Parkinson's group than in the non-Parkinson's group. But there is some really good news in here. Um, and if we look at the maximal scores, which means that people, it, which is the levels of life space that people are reaching, regardless of whether or not they need help, we're seeing that the scores are actually really, really similar across the two groups. So this shows that people with Parkinson's are absolutely getting where they need to go. They might just need a little extra help to do that. So that's really good to see. Um, and we actually see that um, for the final level beyond town that more people with Parkinson's were reporting going beyond town in a typical week. So it means that they're still able to get out there and, and uh, go to places that they want to go. Um, next I'll talk about, excuse me. <clears throat> next I'll talk about uh, the results from that regression analysis that I was talking about, pardon me. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> oh gosh, and we can see that, um, uh, so we can see that people with Parkinson's had a higher life space mobility if they had a driver's license. So that was one of the factors that played into being able to get around in the community, not very surprising. Um, if they had high level of social participation, if they were able to live independently without a caregiver, and if they were comfortable financially. Um, and what we mean by that is that on the survey, they answered that they had enough money to get by or they had more than enough money to get by. So we, we just grouped them all together and called them comfortable. Um, so none of these are, are probably um, very surprising. We live in a very car centric world. So it makes sense that it's easy, easier for people to get around if they still have a driver's license. Um, <clears throat> for the social participation, this is kind of an interesting one, and I'll <coughs> excuse me, and I'll talk about it again a little later on. Um, but because 
of the way that we did this research, it was kind of just a snapshot in time of people's lives. So it's hard for us to say if people who are more um, socially active are more mobile because they're, it just means that they're getting out of the house more and they're going to the Parkinson's Association or to visit with a friend. Um, or if people who are more mobile are able to participate more. So there's kind of um, something that we don't know up there about the timing of these events and, and which is potentially causal of the other. So these were the four things in our regression modeling of all the different factors that we looked at that, that seem to be the most predictive of the life space mobility of people with Parkinson's. So now we'll contrast that to some of the factors that were important for people without Parkinson's. Uh, you'll see some similar similarities and some differences. So this one is similar. Um, they had a higher life space mobility if they were able to live independently without a caregiver. Um, <clears throat> we also found that um, people had a higher life space mobility if they did not have a respiratory condition. So in other words, people who reported having a respiratory condition, uh, we could see that their life space mobility was a bit less. And again, they were financially comfortable. So this just shows that between when you compare people with and without Parkinson's that we probably do need to th be thinking about different factors that affect their mobility. Um, now I'll move on to the qualitative results. So these are interesting because these are um, quotes from the stories that I was told during the interviews uh, about people's mobility. And I think that they really are reflective of the challenges faced by, by this community. Um, so I hope that you guys find these quotes interesting as well. Uh, the first thing here is what we call a code tree, and I don't expect anyone to be able to read this. I just kind of want to show you roughly how we organize this data. Um, so again, in the blue banners there, you'll see those different types of mobility determinants that we talked about from the conical model. So cognitive, financial, environmental, physical, and psychosocial. And underneath all of those umbrellas are uh, what we call themes and sub-themes. So these are, are patterns that emerged from the interviews. Um, that were kind of consistent or similar across different interviews. So first let's talk about some of the barriers to mobility that people uh, brought up. So my anxiety level was so high that I couldn't drive. I did recognize that and it's been that way a couple of times. And the second quote is, and boy, I'll tell you, we lose our licenses and every one of us agrees that is huge. And most of the people I know are in their 60s. You don't wanna use, lose your license in your 60s. You've got a long way to go yet, hopefully. So these two quotes uh, really get at uh, both the <clears throat> some of the problems with motor and non-motor symptoms. So anxiety being the one in the first quote that a lot of people brought up is something that can interfere with their ability to be mobile. Um, and secondly, the importance of, of cars in our lives and how important they are for our ability to participate and be able to do the things that we want to do. I used to be able to run and jog and kick a football and soccer ball with my grandsons. I don't see them very much. They live 10 minutes from here, but they want to play and I can't, so I don't. So we're drifting apart. Uh, and this really gets to the qualitative theme of the, again, the ability to participate. Um, and this is important too, because if we can't participate in the things that we want to do or with the people that we want to, those social ties weaken as well. So there may be less opportunities for engagement or less invitations coming your way in the future. So the next uh, barrier is about challenging physical spaces. Uh, and the quote reads, if there's too many people around like the hockey game, sometimes the concourse is really quite crowded. I can't take big steps. So I take mo micro steps all over the place and then it's hard to keep your balance when you're doing that. It's just difficult to move around when the crowd is that bad. Uh, this was something else that came up several times in the interviews was being in crowded or confined spaces and how that can affect you physically when you're trying to move around. Um, and this is something that, that when we're building accessible spaces that we need to be thinking about on behalf of people with Parkinson's. And again, this theme kind of gets at motor and non-motor symptoms and also the aspects of medication and how that can affect people's movement. So movement is slower, balance is much worse, freezing is an issue, going off medication is something that I have to deal with now. These aren't things that were problems before, but now I seem to be, it, but now, um, it seems to be getting more difficult all the time. 
So we have these uh, wonderful medications that can help us, but they also can sometimes be the cause of a reason why people have trouble with mobility. So that's something that emerged from the interviews as well. So now we will lighten things up a bit and we'll talk about some of the facilitators to mobility because there were so many um, great ways that people had of coping with the challenges that they experienced, uh, which are very important to highlight. Um, so this one is, is about planning excursions, which is something, again, that came up frequently in the interviews and just um, kind of having contingency plans in place for when something goes wrong because our bodies don't always uh, act the way that we want them to. So the first quote reads, I've started to plan my excursions around my medication schedule. My medications seem to wear off in three to four hours, so I'm always thinking ahead about where I'm going to be in three to four hours. Um, you, you, uh, you know, if I have to be somewhere at seven o'clock, what is my pill schedule? What will I be taking at the time? Will I be okay? Will the pills be working? So this is just having the presence of mind to kind of think about how you might be affected in the future if your medications don't behave totally the way that you want them to. Uh, and secondly, every place I have a go, every place I go, I have a route plan that I know where the parking lots are and where there's a coffee shop or something that I can get out of the car and wait for the shaking to go away. Um, so, so I thought that this was a really um, nice example of how people kind of plan in advance. And by knowing that they have a plan, if something goes wrong, that it, it allows them to go out into the community instead of being fearful about what might happen. Next, I'm gonna talk about uh, all the different ways that people kind of received help and the, the ways that uh, they found support in other people to help them be more mobile. Um, so the first one, I probably didn't come up with coping strategies individual, individually, but from others in support groups and being in the study group, uh, and even just an exercise group, some people will say they'll talk about different things that they do. So you put those things together and you think, oh, I'll give that a try. So this is a really good example of how that, that Parkinson's community can be so supportive and just give you tips and tricks for how you can deal uh, with some of the symptoms that people might have not have thought about in, um, by themselves. And again, uh, the Parkinson's Association members, they're the people that I can trust and people that I can discuss issues with that I know I will and with that I know will understand. I don't have to go into great detail because I know they know what I mean. Uh, and there's a really nice point here about finding comfort in the shared experiences. Uh, and I, I know that I had a bit of a bias sample, but lots of people um, spoke about how important the support groups were for them. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the family members that were mentioned uh, quite often in these interviews. So I asked, can you tell me a bit about the people that support you in Parkinson's? And the participant said, well, first and foremost, my wife, who's very forceful at getting me to exercise, and she doesn't want to take ownership of, this, of the disease. It's my task to work on, but we sh she will support me in anything that I choose to do. And lastly, on the theme of receiving help, um, there were some nods to the importance of disease specific education and also getting advice from various professionals. So I'll, I'll just uh, go over some quotes to that effect. So I've told the folks like in charge of the speaker series, um, let's get out the, health, the healthcare people that provide that service and learn about more what's going, what it's going to cost me. What's the feasibility of me getting somebody to help me when I need it? What are the driving services around? Like, let's get educated on it now. So it feels like I really have to do that on my own. Um, and secondly, we went over that today with the occupational therapist of of you know ways of getting in and out of bed so people definitely talked a lot about their physios and their occupational therapists their yoga instructors um, professionals that were really instrumental in giving them some tips and tricks for how to cope with their disease and finally here um, some quotes about how people manage their symptoms and the various ways that they did that. So we'll talk about some coping strategies, uh, vocal exercises, mobility aids, and uh, physical activity, which was something that was mentioned in pretty much every interview. Um, people found that being physically active uh, was helping them with their disease. So the first quote, so when I feel like I'm going to freeze, I should stop where I am and move side to side, do the step side to side, and then it should go to then it should go away. So this was this participant's kind of coping strategy for when maybe something's not working the way that she wants to, um, that she can just kind of stop and like collect herself, do her side to side 
motion and then hopefully her movement will be a bit smoother from there. For my voice, we were thinking of doing karaoke in the winter time when the doors can be closed and we don't scare the neighbors. So this was a, a creative um, idea for someone that someone had for doing vocal exercises. Um, the next one is very short and sweet. The walker is my friend. So people kind of had mixed feelings, I would say, in, their, in, in the interviews about their mobility aids. Um, but on average, I think that people found them useful. And this participant also mentioned how having that physical barrier there sometimes can kind of be a, a visual signal to people who are oncoming that maybe he needs a little bit more space. So he found that helpful as well. And finally, I find if I exercise every day, and I have to be fairly diligent about that, but if I exercise every day, get my heart rate up, I find that my symptoms are better. Uh, and again, exercise seemed to be the thing that, the one thing that everybody mentioned for something that they, they try to do or try to incorporate into their lives um, to help with their symptoms. Okay, so the key findings from this research, just to do a little recap, um, the first one was that the life space mobility of, par of participants with Parkinson's is not statistically different than participants without Parkinson's. Um, and we think that the reason that this is, is because people with Parkinson's are um, using their mob mobility devices so successfully that they're able to get out and do the things that they want to do. Next, participants with Parkinson's who had a driver's license participated socially, were comfortable financially, and did not report um, having needing help from a caregiver had the highest life space mobility. And also the qualitative findings also supported the importance of driving and participating in the community. Um, and generally the qualitative findings show that there's such a vast array of facilitators and barriers that can help people with their mobility. Uh, and finally, the life space mobility of people with and without Parkinson's is explained by a different set of factors. So we always like to do this thing in research where we talk about the strengths and limitations of the project that we've just done because um, all research is, is imperfect. Um, so first, some of the strengths uh, is that this is an, an emerging area of research at the time, uh, and I, I assume this is probably still true, there was only one previous study that had looked at the life space mobility of Parkinson's. Um, but I would say that that looking at mobility comprehensively in terms of the built environment and social factors and how all the things going on in people's lives affect their mobility is kind of gaining momentum in research because it's not just being able to walk or you know, being able to drive a car that affects your mobility. There are so many other things that are going on. Uh, another strength was that we used this novel multiple methods design. So by using the surveys and the interviews, we kind of had, we had quite a bit of information that could complement each other. Um, the interviews and the data from that were able to fill in some of the gaps of, of what maybe we did, what we did or did not capture on the survey. Uh, and it was also novel to use a comparison group. So of people living in the same community, we can directly compare people with Parkinson's to people without them and look at their mobility. Um, some of the limitations was that this was a cross-sectional study, and I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, um, but cross-sectional research is kind of limiting because it just gives you one snapshot in time and you don't know uh, what happens before or after that. Um, there's a possible bias in the way that we recruited people. Uh, so for example, people who are actively involved in the Parkinson's Association are probably um, po are possibly more involved generally than someone who's just living by themselves and maybe doesn't wanna participate. Um, so we might already be sampling from people who are, are more active in the community. I'm not sure, I guess I'll probably never know for sure. Um, and the same with the comparison group, I went to seniors activity centers to recruit people from that. So I'm already only selecting people who are participating in their community that way. Um, two things that we did not capture on the survey, which would have been important, uh, were people's cognition and also their disease severity. Um, those are just two things that weren't gonna be feasible in the, in the time frame and with my level of expertise, but two things that are surely important for people's life space mobility. 
Uh, and finally, the last limitation is that the interviews highlighted some missed opportunities on the survey. So if I, if I was going back and I was going to write the survey again, I would have some new ideas of questions that I wanted to incorporate based on people's answers to the surveys. <clears throat> Um, so this is going to be an analogy of why cross-sectional research is a problem. Uh, well, not a problem, but it has limitations. Um, so I saw this meme on Twitter, which is not a great way to start this analogy. Um, but what we have is a picture of uh, a crater beside a visitor center, supposedly in Arizona, although I have not fact checked this. Um, and the text says, this is a picture of an asteroid crater in Arizona. Look how close it came to hitting the visitor center. So at first you look at this and you're like, oh my gosh, wow, the asteroid you know, really did come close to hitting the visitor center. And then you kind of think about it for a second and you realize that obviously the visitor center was built there after the asteroid hit. Um, but this kind of exemplifies cross-sectional research because what we have is this, this picture in time um, but we don't always know the order of events of how things happened. And so our interpretation of, of the findings of a study might be wrong um, based on the fact that we don't know the order of events chronologically. Okay, so for future research, um, so these were some of the, the things that I identified from our study that would be interesting to look at in the future. So. I'd like to uh, further examine the characteristics of the built environment that facilitate and restrict mobility. So, um, so for example, the people in their interviews bringing up crowded and confined spaces, is that something that we can look at more? Are there other features of the environment um, like being able to step over curbs or uh, the distance between bus stops that are also important for people's mobility? Uh, future research should try to untangle the relationship between social participation and mobility uh, and so I have in brackets there, determine directionality. So try to figure out if one influences the other. Uh, we should look at the impact of cognition and disease severity on life space mobility. And finally, we should try to objectively measure life space mobility uh, by using something like a GPS. So whereas the tool used in this research was, um, was self-reported, it can be hard to recall your actions perfectly. So if we give people a GPS and we can kind of track them around for a little bit to see how far they go, then that would uh, give us confidence in the patterns that we're seeing. And I have a few uh, recommendations here for things that, that in the future practitioners and policymakers should maybe keep in mind. Um, so firstly, the importance of driving. Practitioners should try to help uh, their clients retain the physical and cognitive skills necessary for driving because we do uh, live in such a car dependent society currently and we know that driving is really important for people to be able to get around as I mentioned a few times now. Um, and also practitioners should keep in mind that there are there's so much going on in people's lives and they need to kind of consider the diverse set of personal social and environmental factors when looking at people's mobility. And for policymakers, I think the big takeaway, again, is to improve options for convenient, low-cost transportation um, as an alternative to driving. So my final slide here uh, is kind of just about the potential for impact. So as I mentioned, there haven't been too many studies in this area yet. Um, so we don't kind of have that body of research that we would need to start to make change. Um, but if we get to that point and some of the themes that emerge from this research are consistent within future studies, um, we could help people with Parkinson's age in place and maintain their mobility. mobility. Um, and this would help people improve their quality of life. Uh, it would help with economic benefits because it's generally cheaper to age in place for people um, than to have to go into a home of some kind. Uh, and also it would help to reduce caregiver burden, which are people that were mentioned so many times in, in the interviews, uh, and it's important to try to help them out too. So thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you to all of our participants and the recruitment partners, and to if any of you listening today um, were involved in this research, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and thank you for uh, to the Parkinson's Association of Alberta, the Alberta Association on Gerontology, and the Gyro Club of Edmonton, who are all um, also very helpful with funding for this study. Thanks, Charlotte. That's great. And 
Well, on behalf of the Parkinson Association of Alberta, thank you for all that you've done to, to help people with Parkinson's disease. And thank you for this great research information. I don't see any questions. Um, I see quite a few participants. So that just tells me that you were very good about uh, giving us all the information that everybody was looking for. That was really so. interesting. Yeah, and and uh, I love how you uh, your perspective, for sure. I really appreciate that. All right, everybody. Oh, here we go. All right, I'm going to open the chat here. All right, we have a question here. I assume this study was largely done before the pandemic. Speaking for myself, I get out much less, not due to mobility. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, and I, I thought about mentioning that actually at the beginning, I intended to at the very beginning of this, uh, we collected the data in 2019. Um, so it was well before COVID was on our minds or even in our subconscious. Um, and I actually uh, took a minute last night to look and see if anyone had done studies looking at life space mobility in the times of COVID. Um, and a couple had been done. Um, uh, the one takeaway I think that was important from the one study was that um, life the deterioration or the constriction of people's life space mobility during the times of pandemic seems to be um, have a bigger impact on people who are already frail. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of not a surprising finding uh, for you know people who are are used to getting out and maybe aren't as frail. It can be uh, definitely obviously hard psychologically and on our bodies if we're sitting around so much, but it seemed that um, the life space mobility decreasing in the times of COVID or uh, was most impactful on people who already were having troubles kind of getting out. Yeah, yeah. And there's a worry of, of becoming sick and the restrictions are there. Yeah, yeah definitely. Totally. Um, that's where the nice part Parkinson's Association, we've got so many programs and hopefully, you know, some of the people who are attending today, you've got, you've got some potential to, uh, to get on the internet, etc. So I really encourage everyone to look at our programs and you can visit our, our website at parkinsonassociation.ca and you'll find a lot of stuff that uh, will keep you active and uh, we do do our Zoom um, support groups. It's not as great as being in person, but you know, it, it really kind of fills that void that, you know, that we've all been facing for sure. All right, we have another question here. Um, is there a link to the study? Uh, we don't currently have it um, published yet. That's something that's in the process, but I do have some um, materials that I sent out to the participants who said they were interested in receiving them. So if, if uh, the person who's asking the question um, I can give them my email and I can send them those materials as well. It's just a little something to read um, and an infographic to kind of give a high level understanding. So um, if, if we could facilitate that, I'm definitely happy to send out materials. Yes. Okay. Um, and so we can share your email address with those people. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Okay. And she says, sure. Can you add your email here? Yeah, I can. I don't think I. I don't know if I have. If I can type right now, but I can spell it out to you if you'd like, and we can. Can you get in? Can you see the chat box there, Charlotte? Um. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm typing yeah. it in. Okay, and there's there's a few people that are looking for your link. There we go. <laughs> there we go, everyone. Okay, and as well, if you're interested in viewing this after, uh, we do record it. So it's going to be available in a few days on our uh, our YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to, to look through Charlotte's um, presentation there as well. All right, let's see. Are there any other questions? Those are great questions, everybody. And yeah, the pandemic has definitely slowed us down, hasn't it? All right, hopefully everybody's got it written down. All right, Charlotte. Well, I really appreciate uh, you joining us today. And uh, are you off back to work now or? I am, yeah, back back to the nine to five now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for taking some time to join us for sure. 
It's been my pleasure. Oh, Thank you so much. Okay, for having me. we've got we've got a lady here that says she cannot see your email. Okay, uh, it says to all panelists, but I can I can spell it out too um, briefly. So I'll give people a few seconds to collect a pen and paper if they need yeah. that, and then I'll <laughs> and then I'll spell it. Exactly, and if you uh, if anybody uh, out there wants to contact your your uh, client services coordinator in your area, we also have Charlotte's email. So we can definitely forward you an email or contact one of us and we'll make sure that you get it. So the email is um, all one word, Ryder Burr. So R-Y-D-E-R-B-U-R -R at ualberta.ca. All right. I hope everybody's got that. But again, you can you can email us and we'll make sure that you have it. Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Charlotte, for being able to join us today for this webinar and everyone for joining us as well. And uh, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate your time. And so our next scheduled webinar is going to be on February 17th at 1.30 p.m. And uh, that one is going to be a question and answer period with a pharmacist. Oh, we've got a comment here from Charlotte. Nice presentation, Charlotte. <laughs> Thank you for your effort in bringing this together. Oh, and then Shirley says, now I see it, thanks. All right. So again, everybody, if you wanna take a look at Charlotte's presentation again, you can check it out on our YouTube channel and uh, the link is there on our website. So you'll be able to get it from there. And our website is parkinsonassociation.ca. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much, Charlotte and everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day and uh, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye, you too.